Okay, today I'm with Paul Sears, the drummer from The Muffins, and I'm going to be talking with Paul about the time he spent with uh, Giorgio Gomelski around 78 and his involvement um, in the Zoo Mana Festival, the 12-hour festival in New York that happened in October of 78, where Paul was the sound guy for the entire festival. We're going to talk about how that happened and a little bit about how the Muffins uh, got into New York for the festival, and then uh, some of the relationships that Paul had uh, as a result of meeting Gomelski. So Paul, how, um, how did uh, you get involved with the Muffins? And, and I guess we should state the Muffins were a creative music band based in the DC area. And when did they form? Uh, they formed in 1973 before I uh, before I met them. Wow, 73. That's that's uh, that was quite uh, a while before the uh, festival. And when did you yeah, meet them? I, yeah, well, they were uh, well. They they uh, a long time ago. They had a guitar player named Michael Zentner, who uh, who had uh, he and their drummer uh, at the time. They had a parade of drummers, but they had a they had a good solid rock guy, uh, Stu Abramowitz, and he and Michael Zentner left the band. Uh, so when uh, when I met them, they, they were just a trio. It was uh, Dave, Billy, and Tom Scott. Now, Zentner somehow knew my my bass player in the band I was in just prior to the Muffins, which was a group called Magic Theater, which was sort of very much modeled after uh, later Electric Miles Davis type stuff, you know? Yeah. And uh, um, Zentner had contacted my, my bass player, Pepe Gonzalez, who was still a very dear friend. In fact, I talked to him about a week ago. He's in D.C. He's a major force in the jazz scene there. Uh, Zentner contacted him uh, about, you know, uh, doing some, uh, you know, some, uh, some music. And when uh, Gonzalez heard about the stuff that uh, Mike was into, uh, Pepe just turned him down flat and he says, I don't understand that stuff. I'm not really into it, but my drummer loves it. Here's his phone number. Call him. So what Zentner year is that? Me, what year is that? So Zentner called me out of the blue. Uh, this was in probably the early summer of 1976. And he says, Oh, hey man, you know, I'm into Henry Cow and you know, all this uh, you know, British stuff and Virgin Records and whatnot. And I just came back from England from visiting Henry Cow. And I have some tapes I'd like to share with you. I'd like to play you some tapes. And I went, okay. So he came over and uh, we, uh, he played me up all sorts of crazy stuff. Live Robert Wyatt, live Henry Cow, on, on and on and on. And uh, then he, he started to talk about the Muffins and how he had just quit this band. But he says, I'd really like you to meet these guys. So he took me to see them when they were, playing as a trio in their backyard on the homemade stage back there where that, they actually got on the kind of gigs that they were doing backyard gigs or were they playing any venues but they were playing no they were playing around uh, uh they played at the uh no hell they played uh i don't know probably a dozen or two places as, as a trio what was the dc uh, scene like then for creative music it was it was pretty interesting. It was uh, uh, there were a lot of great bands in the area that were playing original stuff at the time. Uh, there was a band called uh, Grits, who were very very Frank Zappa like, um, and uh, there was another great band called Snake. I think the guitar player ended up in a in a, a more famous band called Caldera a little bit later on. But uh, th th there was a lot of live music. It, it was a pretty healthy music scene. There was a lot of a lot of clubs and uh, lots of bands were playing original stuff. It was pretty cool. Um, so, so anyway, seventy six. Are you guys in college or wh where where are you guys at in your life? Uh, all, all those guys were working day jobs. Everybody uh -huh. was doing day jobs. There was no college. Uh -huh. uh, okay. I, I don't know if anybody in the band ever went to college. Actually, I uh -huh. never did. Uh, anyway. Uh, so Michael Zentner took me to see these guys and uh, we, we hit it off right away. And uh, uh, they sort of said, well, hey, you know, you know, why don't you come and, uh, you know, jam with us and we'll see how things go. So I went and played with them two or three times, uh, just improvising and stuff. And uh, uh, um, 
they very shortly after that asked me to join the band. And then when a, a room opened up in their house, uh, they asked me to move in with them. So I moved in with them and the rest is history. You know, right. boom. Well, let me bring up a, a picture of, of these early days here and we can have a look at the people that you're talking about. Uh... All right, can you see that? Yeah, that's a Trinity Theater for sure. And I believe you said this was a little after 78? Yes, uh, probably towards the end of 78, not long after Zoo. So you guys have been playing together for, for a while now at, at, at this point. Yes, uh, I, I, I started working with them full time in the September of 76. So can you kind of just name who's playing what from left to right? Uh, Dave, Dave Newhouse is on stage right with the long hair. Okay. And when I'm saying stage right, I mean from the per performers, when you're on the stage, stage is to right. What's, he, right. what's he playing there? Uh, Fender Rhodes, he, that, that's, then that's either a uh, flute or a bass. He played saxophone, flute, bass, clarinet. Okay. He played alto sax, barry sax, bass, clarinet, and flute. Uh, I'm playing drums, of course. Uh, Billy Swan on bass and uh, Tom Scott. Uh, who was our only played woodwinds back then. Later on, he started also playing keyboards, but back then he was also, he was just our, our he was our woodwinds guy. All right. So here's a slightly earlier photo of the band. Where is We're this? We're where? House in Rockville, Maryland. And uh, what's that again? I just got out of the shower and my hair's wet and I really didn't want to have my picture taken, but so, and I think it shows. <laughs> what, so what, what house is this? That's where we lived in uh, Mar in Rockville, Maryland, on uh, Portry Drive, right near uh, Hofburg's Delicatessen. I can't remember the name of the shopping mall that was there. It was right off Randolph Road, and not how, far from Rockville Pike. How long did you guys live together in this house? Uh, we lived together. We lived together in Gaithersburg for I think a little more than a year. And uh, then we decided to all live together because Tom Scott was not living with us at the time. And so we went and got that house, uh, which had a uh, more rooms. And uh, Tom and his wife moved in uh, with us. And so all the, the band could be under one roof. And as a result of that, we got excruciatingly tight. Sure. If you've ever heard our, uh, our uh, third album, uh, 185, that's the tightest that band we recorded that thing in two days <laughs> in, in, a, in an analog, a big analog tape studio. I still got the master sport actually. <laughs> yeah. But right. uh, the, the band was, was running on 16 cylinders, I'm telling you. It was so tight. So here's another picture of the band in action. That's uh, Montgomery College. Princeton on the Pike, as it was called locally in uh, Rockville, Maryland. And, th and this again is... Uh... Around 80? No, that would be before, that would be 77, maybe 78. Ah, so, okay. And so you joined in 76? Correct. Okay. So this our lineup, first, this lineup that we're looking at, we're, this lineup that we're looking at here, how long did, the, did uh, you guys stay together? Uh, that lineup stayed together uh, from 1976 to 1981. All right. And how many releases? Uh, geez, uh, we did Man of Mirage, we did Air Fiction, 185, uh, and while the band was still active, uh, we re recorded a couple albums with uh, Fred Frith. Right, so so now that you mentioned Fred Frith, mm -hmm. um, he played a big role in the Mana Festival, and, uh, and uh, he somehow became aware of the muffins before the Mana Festival. So, well, what, these guys, had, well, these guys have been these guys have been corresponding through mail with the with the Henry Cow guys before I ever met them. Okay, I mean, Fred had already contributed guitar pieces to their Random Radar sampler. Same with Lowell Coxhill, you know. And I, I couldn't believe these guys had these relationships going. This wasn't in D.C. These guys were out in what was genuinely regarded as podunk Gaithersburg, you know? Yeah, right, right. 
it was like, yeah. you know, to us city slickers, it was like, you got to be kidding me, a music scene in Gaithersburg, you know, we were like right. chuckling, you know. So Random but Radar was, is like a local label? That was the label that they had all gotten together and formed be, before I ever met them. And uh, so, and so, so they're doing the muffins and this label, and through and through that, they somehow they get in touch with Fred Frith, and does, and does, and he releases something on the label prior to the manifesto. That's what they had. Well, on the first Henry Cow album, I believe they published a, an address on it and said, "If you'd like to get in touch, feel free to write." And they kind of went, "Okay." Yeah. <laughs> we're going to write and so they sure. did and they that's how they uh they were corresponding with these guys before i uh, before i was came on the scene pretty uh -huh. cool so the band had uh quite a relationship with fred frith well well before the man festival then yes they went yeah they were you know posting letters back and forth back in those days yeah mm -hmm. okay and uh you got and then the muffins would would end up playing on a Fred Frith album as well, too. Sure. That was in 1980, after the festival. Right. And which album was that? Gravity. All right. This is like a promo photo of some kind. I think it came from the Cuneiform website. Uh, Very old. Yeah, Steve used a lot of our, uh, a lot of our old photos. Uh, Steve was actually part of Random Radar Records as well. Oh, really? OK. Well, well, we I, knew him when he, I knew him when he was a teenager. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> and he remains to this day one of the kind of the central hub for creative music in the DC area, doesn't he? He's uh he's done uh an awful lot of really good stuff and uh we still work with him. In fact, we're working on a uh multi-disc uh, box set uh right now with Steve. Of unreleased stuff, live concerts, outtakes, uh all sorts of stuff and and a, a zoo track. So here's a picture. It looks like it's in Rockville. Um, yep, construction site where they were. They've rebuilt the downtown area of Rockville. I don't know how many times uh, it's been upgraded and built buildings and all that stuff. And every time I see that picture, I get the willies because that crane collapsed the very next day. <laughs> that crane that's behind that 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 wooden uh, painting there was yeah. probably 150 feet tall. Uh, and it was one of those, it was one of those giant boom cranes that looked like that, you know? So that wall you're standing in front of, was that just for, to, to, for the construction, to separate the construction? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That and, was to guard the construction site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, and, the, and that's just kind of random graffiti that was put on the wall? Yeah, we don't know anything about that. We were just, uh, we just thought it looked cool, so we used it. About what year is this, do you think? Same, that was the same day as the, uh, the, the, the uh, previous photo that you uh, just showed. If you look closely, we're wearing the same clothes. Okay. And, and they sitting there holding the tripod there. That's, that's the same day. And what day is that? I don't remember. <laughs> but I mean, how about before or after the, fest the Mana Festival? Oh, before, I'm sure. Before the festival. Okay. Yeah. And then here's another early photo. That's probably 1980-ish, 79-80-ish. And I think that's the cemetery in downtown Rockville where F. Scott Fitzgerald was buried. Okay. All those okay. photos, all the black and white photos that you've shown were all taken by Sean Pruitt. Okay. Who was very close to the band. Good. Her mom did the cover for Man Mirage, our first album. So, 78 rolls around and Gomelski shows up in New York City and by October of 1978, he's organizing this Zoo Mana Festival. How did you guys find out about this and how did you get involved? Well, here's the crazy thing. Um, I've known Giorgio's name my whole life, going back to Yardbirds 45 when I was 14. And I always wondered about this guy. I thought, how could this dude with this Russian name be involved with all this, this music? And then later on, when I got into more into uh, uh, different stuff, uh, Gong, uh, Magma, John McLaughlin's extrapolation record, they were all produced by the same guy. 
Yeah. And I, 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 I and this was just nuts. So then sometime in the summer of 78, he calls the house out of the blue. To this day, I don't know how he got her number. He might have gotten it from Mike Bloom, the Boston guy. But so anyway, you don't think Fred Frith? Pardon me? You don't think Fred Frith put him in touch? I don't think Fred had our phone number yet. But uh, but anyway, Bloom, you know, Fred, Fred wasn't even in America then, you know. But uh, then uh, Giorgio calls the house and he goes, I'm trying to reach the muffins. My name is Giorgio Gomelski. <laughs> and I almost had a heart attack. I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, you're, you, you've been following me my entire life. You know, now you're on the phone, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it, it really it really threw me. It really my all the hair on the back of my neck. What? <laughs> you know. So anyway, so he gave me a rundown on this festival and uh, I had to go up to New Jersey on other business anyway. So I said, I'll. I'll, I'll just come, I'll come hang out with you and you can tell me about it. So he gave me his address and uh, I went to Jersey and then I trained in New York and his house was a 10 block walk from Penn Station. So I just went down there and spent a couple of days hanging out with him and it was, it was unforgettable. So tell me about your first meeting with Gomelski. What was that? What was, what, what was your first impression? Yeah, I thought I was talking to the offspring of Castro and Stalin. <laughs> well, he, yeah, he was, he was known as the rock and roll Rasputin by some. Pretty much, yeah. He, uh, you know, and I was just, you know, goggle-eyed 25-year-old kid at the time. You know, it was like, oh, my God. And he had, we had, uh, he made, uh, uh, he made rosti potatoes for me for dinner. And uh, we had, uh, we drank an awful lot of red wine and talked all night long. I mean, it was just incredible. I was like. I was like this sodden uh, uh, fanboy, you know? I mean, I couldn't believe it. And so uh, I believe he's about 44 years old at this time. How old were you? Uh, 25, maybe. Okay. 24, 25. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was in his 40s. I remember that. Uh, he told me. Uh, but, and he also gave me uh, the, uh, the first Magma paperback book that, came, that was, done by Antoine Tacon back in the 70s, the, the, the little black and red one. Uh-huh. It's still in my bookshelf. Uh, he gave me a copy of that. And uh, we, uh, so I had to, I had to get off on the phone with the guys and say, hey, man, we're going to play this, this bloody festival up here. And it's, there's going to be a million people here. And Fred and Chris were coming over and David Allen and yada, 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 yada. So, uh, so you spend the whole evening with Gomelski. Uh, there must have been other people. There must have been other people coming and going. I spent about two days with him, actually. Oh wow! Uh, you know, and uh, Bill Laswell was sort of like his lieutenant back then. Okay. His, his, his adjutant, you know, <clears throat> and uh, he was a great guy. We got along well, and in fact, uh, well, while I was there, I got to jam with him and. Uh, Mike Beinhorn and a guy named uh, Cliff Coltrary. Oh yeah, well that's the core of Material, yeah. yeah I played well, I played with all those guys before Material was formed. Sure. Long time ago, long time ago. Uh, and we had a great time. It was just it was just a really cool, cool, cool scene. So you didn't know any of those guys before then? No, absolutely not, no sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. no. Um, and then about, Maybe two weeks before the festival, uh, uh, Giorgio had a guy, a professional sound guy, I think his name was Joe Golden, uh, lined up to do the, the festival. And for whatever reason, he bailed. So I have previous stage and sound experience going back to 1968 and 69, when I worked for the only sound company in Washington, D.C. that could do big shows. So I worked with practically every big show that occurred back then, Black Sabbath, Alice Cooper, Poco, Edgar Winter, I mean, you know, you name it. Uh, so anyway, Giorgio calls me up just out of the blue and he goes, Paul, are you free a few days before the festival? I think I want you to do the sound and you have to come up and practice on the sound system. So I said, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll do the sound. What the hell, you know? So. I went up there uh, a couple days early 
uh, and uh, uh, when I went in the in the front door, Georgia was upstairs uh, on the phone screaming at somebody, and he goes, "Paul, Paul, go on to, go into the living room and have a glass of wine." And so I said, I shrugged my shoulders and went, "Okay." I go in the I go in the room, and who's pouring the wine? Debbie Harry and Robert Fripp. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> and, so I, I remember saying to him, I said, I said, I said, Robert, I said, you're the last guy I expected to run into here. You know? and, and what do you know what he was there for? I know what exactly what he was there for. He was there checking out the New York scene. He ended up playing with a ton of people in New York. Uh, I didn't really know in any in any detail, but I do now. But uh, he, uh, in, in fact, uh, um, we've hung out on a couple of occasions. But he and uh, he he and uh, and uh, and uh, Debbie Harry came came to the festival, sat right in front of me for a good part of the day. So in '78, uh, Eno was also in New York. That um, and uh, Fripp and Eno obviously have a relationship and Eno was recording with the talking heads and 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 ends up also uh getting interested in the no wave scene in new york and releases that no new york album so, i love that record yeah yeah so maybe uh Eno influenced fripp to come to new york in some way yeah i saw the i saw the contortions i saw eight-eyed spy yeah uh, I saw Lydia lunch. I mean, I saw all kinds of crazy stuff out there. I had a great time. Uh, I didn't know my way around. Uh, Bill Laswell, the only time I've ever been on the New York subway was with Laswell. Uh -huh. He took me just shuttling around the city. We went record shopping and had lunch and, you know, yada, 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 yada. He was a cool dude. Yes. Yeah, so D.C. and New York are not that far apart. And it's how long is the train ride from D.C. to New York? Oh, about four hours, five hours. Uh, okay. I was wondering how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, intersection there was between the New York creative music scene and the DC creative music scene and is around 78. Well, there was, uh, there were, you know, there were some new waivers in DC. Uh, there was a band called uh, the Urban Verbs. In fact, Eno produced their first record, I believe. Ah. Uh, and, uh, even later on, uh, uh, I knew those guys pretty well. And when the Muffins split up, uh, their singer, Roddy France, who's actually Chris France's little brother from the heads, talking heads, he says to me, he says, Paul, man, we need your bass player. Can I have his phone number? <laughs> so so after the Muffins split, Billy joined their Urban Verbs and uh, toured Italy with them, you know. Mm. And uh, uh, there was a little bit of cross-pollinization between New York and D.C., not, not a whole lot back then because uh, communication was still all analog uh, back then. Mm -hmm. The internet wasn't on computers yet. <laughs> right. And, uh, and uh, so, so the night before the, the festival, uh, the, the sound system was, by the way, a Pink Floyd rental system. Pink Floyd had sound systems, I guess, you know, in several locations in in America, strategically located so they could use them when they were here. Uh, so, uh, so you had to I, get. You told me you had to get trained on this system that you were totally unfamiliar with. Yeah, I'd never touched it before. I mean, I knew what it was. I mean, I know what a Midas mixer does and all that stuff. But uh, he, uh, uh, the uh, the Pink Floyd guy came by Gomelsky's house and picked up. Uh, I think it was David Allen and I. And we went to see the, the Art Ensemble of Chicago was in, was playing at the theater the night before the festival. So that was my practice. And that's this, that's this, for the Art Ensemble. that's huh? the Intermedia Theater that's on the poster here? Yes. It was at, uh, hell, intersection of second and somewhere. It's a movie theater. It's actually a Jewish heritage movie theater now, I think. Okay. And this, so the festival... You know, we're talking about a 12 hour long music festival here. And uh, on this it poster, ended long, it ended up being a longer one than it was longer than that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that uh, later. But this list, this list of people who are involved is uh, extensive. 
Yeah. Um, you you uh, you're working with the sound system that you're just barely familiar with, and you you uh, were telling me that <laughs> of this long list of bands, absolutely no one got a sound check. That's correct. In fact, uh, that theater was so jam packed, and there was no electronic communication between the soundboard and the stage. And that theater was so full that when I needed any real information, I would run out the front door, go down the alley, go behind the building, in the loading dock, and get to the stage the back way. Yeah, I, wanted to to I just wanted to show the picture of the, uh, of the stage. You said this picture was taken at about two in the morning af after the, everything was set up? Yeah. To get, just to get ready to go the next day. Correct. So, <laughs> a lot of so, people helped out with that. Um, so describe uh, the setup for you the sound at the soundboard. How many mics are you having to deal with here? Oh, I got, I think I had, I think I had, jeez, uh, 32 channels uh, and, and maybe a, a, a few of them were DIs. I think the keyboards were DI. Uh, everything else was uh, live microphones. And uh, so I'm going to I'm, I'm guess there was anywhere from 20 to 24 live mics on that stage. So given that you didn't have a sound check with anybody. Um, it was very, very difficult to do. Yeah. So how chaotic was it? I mean, so uh, were it, there. It uh, take, take, take chaotic times 10 to the fifth power and add five <laughs> zeros. Uh, that's how it was. And did you have anybody uh, helping you with the, you know, in between yes, bands? Yes, I did. I did. I did. I did. Uh, but first, I want to uh, mention a few people that helped out with the stage. Uh, sure. We had we had uh, uh, Jane Bliss, who's actually on Facebook. Uh, Tina Swanson, who later ended up marrying Fred Frith. Uh, gosh, uh, Keith Maksud, who was the bass player. He later became the bass player in Prezant or present, however you want to say it. And uh, I've, I've done a bunch of recording and playing with him in the last decade. Uh, Jane, yeah, uh, Barbara Leeds. Uh, gosh, uh, there was a whole, whole crew of people. But I had a friend who came up from Maryland uh, named uh, Tom Acuna, who uh, also was at least conversant with what a Midas mixer was. And so when I, so when the muffins played, uh, I think Tom did our sound with uh, Tom's wife, Colleen, advising him when things were going to occur, which was kind of neat because at no other time did I know what was going to occur. <laughs> <laughs> were there any disasters during this 12 hours? Ah, uh, there was a bunch of well. There was other than feedback, nothing. There was no train wrecks or anything. There was, you know, we didn't have to. Yeah, we didn't have to interrupt the show for anything ever. Because I mean, because you, you're not only doing the live sound, you're also recording the thing, right? I, yeah, if you if you want to call plugging a tape deck into the mixer recording, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't paying any attention whatsoever to the tape recorder. I, I didn't see. have time to. It just I rolled. Didn't... It just rolled the entire time. <laughs> Pretty much. In fact, I think somewhere I have a picture of it, and I think it's a, uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, can you put the screen back so I can, so uh, so we can sh screen share again? I mean, so can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Um, okay, I, I see you. Okay, but anyway, it was, I'm sure, I'm sure it, was was a, it was a tape deck just like this one. It was a uh, Tascam 3340, uh -huh. which I have. I happen to have one, and a Nakamichi tape deck too, uh, cassette deck. And I think it belonged to Mike Bloom, who was the uh, Boston Phoenix uh, uh, music guy. And in fact, I think that's Mike Bloom's white SG that Fred played. I think that was his guitar as well. Now that I think of it. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, what is probably, prob I, I was going to say this is New York Gong, but maybe not, because this is, uh, 
It looks like, is that, who's on drums there on the right? On drums, that looks like Cutler. Yeah, that's what I thought too, yeah. That looks like Chris. Oh, actually, I, I do have the uh, information. Here we go. Um, so this says, uh, from left to right, this is Dr. Space, who you yeah, know. Joe, yeah, cool dude. He played a uh, he played a synthesizer that looked like a cross between a glass pack muffler and a chrome bassoon. <laughs> and uh, next to him is uh, Giorgio Gomelski. Right. And what he's doing on the stage at this point uh, in the show, we don't know, right? He was probably wanting to know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> As was I. Yeah, right. Right. And then uh, in the center there, that's David Allen, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on next to behind him uh, on bass is Bill Laswell. Correct. Looking very young. And he was, uh, yeah, he's a few years younger than I am. And then uh, Chris Cutler on drums. And the, uh, the little note I got on this is that this photo is by uh, Jeff Wooten, who uh, along with a, this, this was somebody posted this on Facebook, uh, along with uh, a gang of uh, people and DJs from the Prague radio show, A Fresh Air out of Kent State University in Ohio. These people attended the uh, Zoo Mana Festival in the fall of 78. And they got some uh, excellent pictures. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a, a couple of huge folders full of pictures, one from Wooten and one from somebody else, I think. They're probably all up on that date on that website. So here's another shot of the stage, wide angle. That's, that's a great photo. I'm not sure if it's a real photo, though. I think some of it might be a, a montage. But uh, um, if you look closely, you can see, uh, well, actually, I'm smoking a cigarette. That's very rare that I smoke a cigarette when I'm playing the drums. Uh, but uh, just over my right shoulder, that's Mike Beinhorn. Uh, Stacy Reaney is the kid, the taller kid in the front, where you can sort of actually see her face. Oh, the, uh, I mean the, the, pic, the, the pixies you're talking about there? Correct. Yeah, she's she's probably 45 years old now. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, Who, and whose kids were these? Uh, Judy, the girl that's wearing, no, the, only one of them was a kid I knew. Uh, the, the Judy, <clears throat> the gal that modeled the zoo shirt, that's her, her mom. And so these were, they, they, they were on stage for the David Allen set for, the, for I assume, the, the Pothead Pixie. Correct. Uh, for New York Gone. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, who else do you recognize? And then, well, uh, it, uh, sitting on the floor behind Laswell, he's like beating on a tom-tom, is uh, Rob Gottlieb, who goes by uh, Rob the Drummer. Look him up on uh, Google. He's in. He's a he's a cool dude, and uh, he does uh, he's got uh, he does uh, youth like youth entertainment, drum therapy, and all sorts of good stuff. And he's he's a, he's a good guy. I met him at a I met him at another festival about uh, ten or twelve years ago. And then uh, there's Laswell, and then that guy the, the black the guy in the black with the guitar. I'm pretty sure is Michael Lawrence, who was in a band called Michael Lawrence Plus. And uh, I don't recall if they actually played at the festival or not, but there he is on stage with a guitar. So he was there doing something. And then uh, that gal, the older gal there is uh, uh, Julie Smith. And that, that's, yeah, that's so she, she was uh, uh, David Allen's partner and then she was, uh, um, part, she did the band Mother Gong, right? That's correct. Yes, she visited. Yeah, she uh, uh she visited our house uh, down in Rockville. Uh, uh -huh. She was one of the many many people that came to, to visit us. Uh, gosh, we had a we had a parade of people. We had Hector Zazu, Chris Cutler, Giorgio Gomelski, uh, uh, Jean Luc Caracos, who used to run Big BYG Records, uh, which became Celluloid. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Uh, he was a 
he looked like he looked like he was the only guy I've ever seen in Rockville that actually looked like a pirate. I mean, he really did. <laughs> I, I saw there's a pretty good interview with him on uh, on YouTube that I saw recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. he and uh, yeah, yeah, they, they actually came. Giorgio, Giorgio actually blew into town and actually came over to our house and made dinner for us. Yeah. <laughs> And and that would have been how long after the uh, the zoo festival? Oh, right after it, because not long after the zoo festival in the in the next year, I was invited to join. Dave uh, David wanted to put together a, a new New York gong, and uh, he wanted me, Laswell, Alan Hertzberg, the guitar player from Manster, uh, and Kramer on trombone, and uh, he wanted that to be New York gong. Right. And so <clears throat> I asked David, I said, do you, do you want me to learn any of the uh, gong repertoire? And he went, he, he went, sort of went, no, we're just going to bloody wing it, you know, come on up to Giorgio's, you know. So I, so I go up to Gomelsky's and uh, with my gal, my gal friend, and uh, she had the forethought to bring along a little portable mono cassette deck. So I recorded us. And uh, there's the only one recording in existence of that version of New York Gong, and I have it. Oh, really? And uh, and you've never released that, I assume? No, no, absolutely not. One, it's not to me. It's it's actually not a bad for a basement bootleg recording. It it ain't bad. Uh, it's just I don't think much of the music is very interesting, and I've only let two copies of it out. And one was to uh, David's son. Uh, no, I can't remember his name. He's a drummer. Orlando. I sent a copy of it to Orlando, and I gave a copy of it to Don Falcone, who produced David's last album that I played on. Right. David Allen, Weird Quartet. Yeah. Yeah, I played on that. So yeah. even though I ended up declining this gong thing because... There was no real plan, and I can't just hang around in New York with no plan, you know. Uh, yeah. And I was still in the I was still in the muffins, you know. And they were, you know, they gave me the green light, you know. Yeah, you want to go do a tour with David? Go ahead. So, so. Well, they I, would. Yeah, they would end up touring North America in around April, I believe. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they. You know who they got to replace me? Stu Martin. Yeah. Yes, I I have heard that story, and Stu only lasted. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long, but he didn't. He uh, exited the tour mid tour, and uh, Bill Bacon took over. I know, I know. Um, yeah. I, I was, uh, I was sort of, I was sort of in, loosely in the loop on all that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Stu Martin. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, uh, when they did they they did the Baltimore. I can't remember what the hell they called it. it was the Baltimore Zoo Festival or whatever it was. I can't remember what it was, but New York Gong played at it with Stu Martin. I was the MC actually. So um, the, in this 12 hour long festival, there was uh, a section dedicated to this discussion panel. And uh, the dis um, let me see if I can. It was basically. Yeah, yeah, I have the. Let me let me read the information here from the uh, posting. It says uh, this is from the Muffin Scrapbook. Uh, the controversial discussion group at the Zoo Festival in New York City, from uh, the left, Robert Crisgow, Village Voice, right. Chris Cutler, mm -hmm. Cliff Coltrary, New York Gong. No, that's John Page. Ha. Huh. The guy in the dark oh, wait, jacket. John, no, it says John Page next. So Cliff Coltrary must be next to next to John Page. And Maybe. then, and then uh, Michael Bloom from the Boston Phoenix, and then David Allen all the way on the far right. Right. And, and that was a trip. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about this discussion. And so how do how do they insert the, this discussion into the you know, into the middle of this music festival. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't design the sets. No, no. I mean, how did how, how did they segue into a, a discussion? I assume there's some band. There are several bands playing, and then there's this there discussion. Several bands played. Okay, all the all the the bands near the bottom of the page played on that poster, and then 
just before uh, Manster, the Muffins, the Muffins with Yashko Sefer, which, which by, by the way was a blast. He stayed with us and he wrote a tune for us to play at Zoo together, which we did. It's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, after we got the, the, the No Wave bands played, uh, we had the, uh, they did the debate. It was probably about five or six in the afternoon after, you know, give everybody's ears a break because believe me, I sure needed it. Uh, and uh, then, uh, and then we brought on the bands that uh, uh, that uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, Manster. Well, actually, it was called Robal. It was Rob and Alan Hertzberg with Bill Laswell on bass. And uh, I, I'm not sure who the drummer was. It might have been Fred Mayer. But uh, they did a pretty cool set. I enjoyed it. I, 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 I still play that. And uh, I was in touch with Alan for years after the festival. And then he kind of dropped out of sight. I don't know what happened to any of those guys. Well, can you tell me a little bit about how that discussion went? It was basically the, the, the subject matter, by the way, was progressive rock better or worse than punk rock. It was <laughs> punk rock. It was basically punk rock, progressive rock debate. That's what it was. Huh. Uh, and it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> well, the, the term progressive rock must have had, uh, you know, different connotations then because uh you, you're talking you're not just you're not talking about yes and emerson lake and palmer here you're talking about creative the creative music scene right exactly yeah and uh and uh the uh that that evil prog word hadn't even been invented yet, <laughs> yeah. you know right Science and you've got robert fripp in the audience <laughs> oh man he, he, he was such a gentleman he was so he was just he was just a gentleman very nice guy Debbie Harry was very was wonderful. We had, I had a great time hanging out with them, talking to them. Really enjoyed, really enjoyed uh, their company. Do you know uh, if they stuck around for the discussion group? <laughs> I have no clue. I, I, but, you know, I, 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 I talked to Robert fairly often, actually. Uh -huh. um, in fact, uh, uh, when I was in England a couple years ago visiting my family, uh, he suggested I take a train to where he was, and he picked me up and took me on a tour of Worcester Cathedral. Huh. If you Google, fun. if you Google, he and I just put our names into Google. It'll take you to his website and show you photos from that day. Oh wow! How oh, nice! It's pretty. Fun. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, when I got uh, when I when I I agreed to meet Robert, I said, "Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just you know." He just said, "You know, come to you know Worcester train station, Shrub Hill." I went, "Okay, sure, whatever." And then uh, while I'm on the train, I'm thinking to myself. I have never been to this place before. I have no clue how I'm supposed to connect with him when I get there. Uh, so I get, uh, I know this is off the subject, but it's a funny story. Sure. So I, I get about three steps off the train and I hear this little voice going, pull it over here. And I look off, and, and, and I look to my right and there's Bob Fritz standing in the corner with a camera taking my, taking my picture. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so, so then, uh, uh, we went to lunch and uh, and he took even more photos. And so I, I, I reciprocated by taking pictures myself. And I told him, I said, you know, some of these might just wind up on the internet. And he just looked at me really funny. He goes, I'll beat you. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> well, it turns out that this, uh discussion group was also recorded along with all the bands and there and this and the recording is available on the Giorgio Gomelski tribute website oh my so, god uh, uh, if anybody wants to revisit the the great progressive rock punk rock debate mm -hmm. uh, it's there and uh, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of the gist of it I, I, I forget I've uh, uh, I haven't listened to that although I, I have I have all those files because uh, David sent them to me a couple of years before that site went up. All right, so here's the program from uh, from the festival, and you were saying this was eight or eight pages long, or something like that. Eight, eight maybe ten pages long, and I believe I have one shoved in a bag somewhere. 
So you're and I have an original poster. I'm going to be bugging you for, <laughs> for a while to uh, locate that because I want to see the rest of it. Yeah, that's here, okay. Because that, no, you're not going to have to bug me for too long because okay. uh, the Muffins archives is, are a pretty big thing. And uh, we're working on the, the booklet for the box set that we're doing with Cuneiform. All right. And, and so uh, I'll be visiting that. I'll be visiting all that stuff very soon to, to extract material from that that we may or may not put in the back of the booklet but I'll make sure you get a copy of it. Great, thanks. And here's a little uh, excerpt on, uh, so I, I guess there was a little description of every band, huh? I guess, yes, I believe so. And there's the muffins description. And uh, and I guess this is an ad from uh, the DC record label. Yeah, from Random Radar Records, that was our, our label. And then- uh, there's, a there's a typo in there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the Art Bears record is hopes and fears, plural. Oh, oh okay. Hmm. Whoever did that forgot the S. <laughs> All right. And then on the uh, one of the last pages, it says, looking forward to the Zoo label. Now, Zoo, Zoo was Gomelsky's uh, marketing name. He, where he... Yeah, lived, yeah, yeah, yeah. He lived, yeah. He li he lived he, at the... He lived in the zoo house where the uh, where the rehearsal studios were. Uh, yeah, and all he did all he did was reverse uh, uh, Christian Vander's "Us Univeria Zect," uh, and he okay. just turned it around to ZU. Uh huh. All right, because uh, he had the uh, it was called the Zoo Manifestival, of course, and then yes. uh, and he was he ha he. He did a record label in the uh, 60s, I believe, called uh, uh, Marmalade. Marmalade, correct. And that was connected with Polydor or someone like that. And uh, yeah, they, yeah, they definitely had to have Disney for one of the that, big ones. And that label released uh, um, John McLaughlin's first solo album, along with other stuff. Stuff by yeah, Julie, uh, Julie George, George produced Extrapolation. Yeah, he produced it. And... Uh, and, and uh, uh, Julie Driscoll and Brian Auger uh, released uh, stuff on Correct. Marmalade. Uh, so Marmalade went on for a couple of years, but it did eventually go bankrupt. And uh, as far as I know, he didn't, this is the zoo, the zoo label was his next attempt to try and do a label. Uh, yeah, I think it was after his falling out with uh, his partner, uh, Kevin Eggers. They had the... Uh, uh, Gomelsky Eggers Music and Information Company and the label they had was you I believe it was called Utopia and then it became Tomato. Oh, okay. Now, yeah, Utopia rings a bell for sure. But if you notice uh, the, the uh, but the if you if you look at the Utopia recording of uh, Udo Voodoo by Magma, Giorgio's name is on it. If you look at the Tomato recording of Udo Voodoo by Magma, his name is not on it. Uh huh. But he produced the record. Okay. Yes. So um, I know um, the very first material EP was first released on Zoo Records, and then uh, soon after was re-released on uh, Red, I believe. All right, here's a t-shirt that was apparently... Uh, I didn't even know that existed. That was in the bag of stuff that my man, our old manager gave me in Baltimore back in probably 2003 or 2004. Our manager, Bill Poole, who uh, was great and a great guy. Uh, he's, he's the guy that hooked us up with the uh, Broadway gig. Uh, and uh, he uh, came and handed me a, a bag of stuff. And a couple of days later, I looked in it and there was that shirt. It's the only one I've ever seen. And you know who our model is here? That's Judy. Her last name is Prantel, P-R-A-N-T-L. And uh, she's the mom of one of the pothead pixies at the zoo festival, Stacy. And uh, that photograph was taken next to my shed in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> in probably 2000, uh, probably in 2008 or nine, when we went, when we went to, to France to play at the RAO festival, uh, Judy uh, watched our house and our dogs for us. And uh, 
This is Georgetown a, University, yeah. Georgetown University Trinity Theater, uh, probably late 1978, maybe 79. So That's, this will uh, be a couple months after the festival. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, we decided to do our own little festival, and uh, Fred and uh, uh, Peter Blakevat and Greaves were, you know, hang, hang, hanging around in New York. So we decided to <clears throat> to do to do something with them, and they came and stayed at our house. And uh, we rehearsed uh, some of uh, uh, Blake Vads and Greaves' music, and when we played it with Fred, so we played with uh, three guys from Henry Cow. And I wish we had I wish we had more time to rehearse because it, it's a, the uh, the performance was um, uh, okay. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> so I'm showing the. Uh... Giorgio Gomelski uh, tribute website here. This is a this is the page that has all the recordings from the Zoo Festival on it. And according to uh, Dave Soldier, who uh, was responsible for digitizing a lot of uh, maybe all of this stuff, um, he did. He, he did what? He did all of it. He did all of it. Yeah. He says that this is pretty much. Everyone who performed at the festival, except for Glenn Branca's theoretical girls, and I'm trying to help him track down that uh, recording, um, and then we would have a almost complete uh, set of recordings from the Zoo Mana Festival. Well, there might be a bootleg of it floating around somewhere. I mean, I've 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 had people over the years have sent me several Zoo bootlegs, but I don't think I have that. They uh, they tend to send me. Uh, our set and the uh, set that we uh, and and the, and the last tune we did with uh, with Yashpat Sefer, which if you've never heard it is pretty cool. <laughs> it uh, it well, was uh, it was among the top top shelf audience responses we've ever had at a concert. Right. <laughs> so so Paul, you you were sound man at the festival. You're you're recording the festival. It's a really long festival. Uh, at the end of the night, uh, they actually pull the plug on you, I believe. Because That's correct. Tell, yeah, me they little, did. Tell, tell me about that. Uh, well, they came in and uh, uh, they came in, oh gosh, towards the end of the gong, towards the end of the gong set, which was, I don't know, 2, 2.30 in the morning or something. And uh, the, uh, uh, People that managed the building had, had frankly had had enough, and uh, the band just would not stop playing. So uh, I don't know. I I don't think the cops got called just yet, but they but they clipped the power, and so David Allen, yeah, they clipped the power, and, and David Allen just said anybody who wants to come up on stage and bang on stuff to do it. So. Next thing you know, there's 50 people on stage pounding on cowbells, drum sets, cymbals, saw blades, I mean, trash cans, whatever whatever could be hit was being hit. Uh, and then uh, they uh, uh, they shut the lights out, I, I think, around 3 or 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so about how many people are left in attendance at that point? Oh, the place was absolutely jam-packed. Really? People stayed for the whole 12 hours? Oh yeah, man! Oh, that place was the place was ridiculous because everybody wanted to, you know, the the man of the hour was David Allen. Everybody wanted to see Gong. The plug gets pulled at the end. People are obviously the that it doesn't. The recording ends at that point. Uh, sure the audience is invited on stage. Uh, a lot of acoustic uh, pounding is going on. Oh yeah. Uh, and this recording, I assume, ends up with uh, Gomelski somehow. And because uh, he has this plan. What's that? I'm trying to remember who who was changing the tapes because I never put a tape on the tape machine. Huh. I had I had to, I had I had too much. My hands were full. Trust me. You I'm know, just sure. With, just I mean, you're, not only, you're not only doing sound, but you're playing in one of the bands, too. Uh, yeah, 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 it was, uh, yeah, and then we had the, we had the eight-piece muffins at the end, where we played with, uh, Yashko's guys. Aha, uh -huh. so who did sound yeah. when you were playing? Pardon me? I mean, who did the sound while you were on stage playing? 
my friend uh, Tom Acuna from Maryland, who came up to the festival and was a big help, and uh, with uh, Tom Scott's wife, Colleen, helping, yeah. and I, I think telling him when things were going to occur, right. which was the only time that ever happened. I mean, the whole time I was at that mixing board, I never had anybody warn me about anything that was going to happen. It was just, it was chaos times 10 to the fifth power with a bunch of zeros after it. It was yeah. really, it so was, these, it was unbelievably chaotic. So these, uh, these tapes of the festival obviously end up with Gomelski. Um, did he tell you or the muffins or anybody what his plans were for these for these tapes? No, never. Uh, I, I got a, I remember getting a, I remember getting a cassette from uh, Laswell, uh, maybe two weeks after the festival with our stuff on it, and that's, and then I never heard another word about anything until oh, so, I. So you started did receive a cassette, though. You you did get a cassette. I had to ask. No, I had to ask Giorgio. Oh. You know, is there any way that you will, you know, can you? can you let me have our stuff, you know? And he would always say, oh, well, he'd, he'd come up with it. He'd throw up an excuse, you know, it's why he wouldn't give it to me, you know? Was, and, and this went on for, you know, 30 years. Right, so you, you kept in touch with Gomelski over the years. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about- No, whenever I was in New York, I'd, I'd call him up and uh, I'd go hang out with him. And um, I, I tried to, he, he didn't like leaving the house. I tried to take him out to lunch. I tried to take him out to dinner. Uh -huh. And he uh, was not into uh, uh, doing anything. You know? No, he's cooking for you, right? <laughs> yeah, he cooked for me, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, you said one time. You said. You said uh, oh yeah, and then he came down and made dinner at our house in Maryland. Uh huh. Right. And yeah, uh, we, so you, we still laugh about that. We see you would... we see Giorgio on TV. And we go, yeah, that guy made dinner for us. <laughs> <laughs> so over the years. You made several attempts to try and uh, get a copy of the muffin set at ZooFest. Um, and you said that uh, um, your relationship with Giorgio got a little heated at some point. How, how did that? Well, I didn't, I didn't. Well, after he kept telling me to, after he kept blowing me off, I, I didn't talk to him for uh, four or five years. Oh, I see. Uh huh. That just made me so mad. I mean, you know, and then. Uh, Back around 2000 or 2007 or eight, I suggested, you know, you know, we, we should really ought to digitize that stuff before it all like goes away. Right. And uh, he just would never follow through or focus on it or anything. And uh, uh, shortly after, back in the uh, early 2000s, you know, I built one of these, you know, I, I, you know, I built recording computers and uh, suggested that you know, why don't you just let me have all these darn things and I'll, and I'll digitize them. I'm not going to do anything with them. I'll just make CDs and, and give them and give them back to you. I, I do just for everybody. And he, he just, he would just never do it. And uh, I don't know how S Soldier found out about it. Soldier found out that I was after all this stuff. And uh, after Giorgio passed away, uh, David got in touch with me and says, well, guess what? You know, I got all this stuff that was on its way to the landfill. Giorgio's people didn't want any of it. So uh, he he had the tapes baked. Uh-huh. Because, uh, do you know what that means? Yeah, yeah. Well, old tapes, it's, well, it's, help, it's helpful to... Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the, the, uh, uh, the mylar separates from the, from the, from the backing. Uh, you know the uh, uh, the actual tape, the oxide, the oxide, and the mylar separate. So there's a purpose-built oven you can buy. Uh huh. Yeah. If you um, and you you bake the tape, and then you have one try to play it, and you better get and you better capture it then. Right. In fact, uh, that's what happened with the uh, the muffins first album. Our uh, our masters were. Uh, very poorly stored back then. And uh, we got, um, you know who Happy the Man were? Oh yeah, I know. I, I have several of their uh, releases. Kit, Kit Watkins remastered, he baked 
our old quarter inch masters and uh, and remastered that out for the CD. Uh -huh. And it is an enormous improvement over the old vinyl pressing. Uh -huh. So do you have any uh, recollection of the last time you talked to Gomelski and what, what that was like? Yes, uh, I went to, my wife and I went to Broadway for something. Uh, to, we went up to Broadway to see, no, I don't know what it was. We, uh, we, go, to, we go to some shows, you know. I like going to Broadway shows. I like, the, I liked, uh, you know, we went, to the, we went to the producers. We went to, uh, uh, oh hell, Phantom of the Opera. There's a whole bunch of stuff we went to. And the last time I was up there, I, 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 just, I, just, I just called him up and he said, oh yeah, come on over. So we come over and hung out in that room full of computers that he's, he's pictured in, in his obituary. Remember what year that was roughly? Oh, hell. Uh, he died in 2016. It would have been 2000. It would have been in the, in the sometime around 2010 or two, 2011. I forget when. Okay. And then, <clears throat> well, we got, I may, I may still have emails on my server uh, from, uh, from him after that. It was, you know, we, you know, we just, uh, his email address used to be gio1 at rcn.net. That I remember. Hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we might have talked a couple of times on the phone after that, but uh, I didn't really, I didn't really know that he was in bad shape. I had no idea. Well, apparently. In that uh, bad shape, I didn't know. Yeah, he, he did pretty well up until the last, few, you know, the last couple, three or three years or four years. Were a little rough I, do for him. When, I do remember when he went in the hospital the first time. Uh huh. Because there was some buzz about that. Somebody sent me some information about it, and I went, "Oh no, sorry to hear that." Right. So this, uh, the zoo oh. man. Yeah, go ahead. Here's a funny, funny Gomelski story. Okay. When the muffins, um, we were playing at the Prague Day Festival, which we've played at several times, and I played there with. Uh, Clear light. I played there with Mike Keneally, uh, a really cool jam session, and uh, the Muffins played there. We headlined there in 2010, actually. Uh, so anyway, uh, 2002, we get our second gig at the uh, at the uh, Prague Day Festival, which is a consecutive festival gig. The next year is very rare. You very rarely get to play the same festival twice in a row. So anyway, that was really cool. So, mind you. I couldn't get Giorgio to come down the street and see us when we played at the Ning Factory. Right. I couldn't get him out of his house to come down the bloody street, you know. So he calls me up out of the blue and he says, oh, how are you doing? You know, I hear you were playing at this uh, Prague Day Festival in uh, New Raleigh, North Carolina. And I went, yeah. And <laughs> turns out he had a girlfriend in the neighborhood and he was coming down to visit her and he hit me up for guest passes to this festival <laughs> i've got i've got a really i've got a couple cool pictures of that and in fact he introduced us at the festival huh which and we have a, which have i i don't know if that's i don't know if that's on the box set or not it might be but uh but he came down with a video camera and hung out with us uh and i, I just thought it was funny i thought well georgia i couldn't get you to come out the door to see me when i was playing down the street but here a woman is involved. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I connect the dots here, you know. So anyway, so he came down and we had a nice time hanging out. And he did yeah. some interviews with us, which um, a friend of Dave's got all the videotapes. Okay. A friend of his named uh, Beth Lash. Yeah. She is sifting through this stuff, trying to find our interviews if, if they exist. Yeah, she has quite an archive apparently that she's uh, working with. But she and... doesn't know who any of these people are. So right. so she's uh, she just wrote to me the other day and she told me she's going to send me some some stills. Okay. From the videos, you know, so I can maybe help her identify whatever she sure. has yeah. from back then. But uh, so but Paul... Giorgio, uh, Giorgio had he, Giorgio had a really cool prototype of a website up and running the last time I saw him. Uh -huh. He had he had a 
big fat website with about a thousand little tiny pictures on it of people. And if you clicked on one of the pictures, up would come a story about them, who they were, and some history. Huh. It was actually pretty cool. But I don't I don't think he ever got it uh, functioning. Hmm. Like like his record label, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Georgia. But uh so Paul, um you have remained active in the creative music scene now for decades. Yep. Looking back to 1978 at the Zoo Mana Festival, what would you say the impact of that festival was on uh, the muffins and maybe the greater creative music scene? Uh, enormous. We're talking about it today, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Right. <laughs> so, so what happened? So what did what happened with the muffins after the festival? Uh, we. We released another album, uh, Air Fiction, and then um, uh, we played a bunch more local shows. And then um, Fred Frith moved to New York and called us up and asked us to play on this album, this Gravity record that he was doing. So we ended up doing one side of that, and the great Swedish show, uh, Zamla Mana was Mana, ended up doing the other side of it. Uh -huh. so we recorded that. We recorded that at Tom Scott studio and uh, Fred took the recordings to Europe and uh, got the rest of the guys that were there that were gonna play on it done and tarted it up and uh, Gravity came out. And it's a great record, fantastic record. Yeah, I love uh, it. Love it, yeah, I, I love that record. And then and then a funny thing happened on the way to the, to the forum. Um, I went into a local record store uh, that was called uh, Yesterday and Today it was in Rockville on Rockville Pike, and it was uh, it was it was up and running. Uh, it was running when your wife was there. It was yeah. it was there in the late eighties, nineties, might even be up to the early two thousands. I forget. But uh, Skip Groff ran it, and uh, you, you you might want to look him up. He is a very knowledgeable rock and roll journalist. He knows more. I think he's been quoted in more Beatles books than probably anyone else. He's okay. very very. He, he knows him. He, he's got a lot of back. So anyway, and he's a, a, a treasure trove of rock and roll information. So anyway, so I, I walk into the bloody record store and Skip goes, hey, Paul, great new single. And I asked, I said, the hell are you talking about? And he pulls out the uh, Dancing in the Street, what, of the 1145 on Ralph Records. <laughs> nobody, nobody ever told us that was going to be a single. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the same thing with buy or die we didn't know that was going to come out either that buy or die ep that's got uh, gravity tracks on too <laughs> huh. and uh, what projects are you involved in uh uh recently that you'd like people to know about uh geez uh i do a lot of work with uh don falcone the producer in uh, near san francisco who does Spirits Burning, and uh, we've done a bunch of bunch of records together. And uh, on those records have been uh, guys from Hawkwind, uh, Michael Moorcock, Robert Berry, uh, John Ellis, the tour guitar player for the Vibrators and Peter Gabriel. Um, and I've, I've done a mess of records with, with those people. Um, I, uh, Evolution Ritual just came out by Spirits Burning, and it's got... Uh, it's got uh, me on it. It's got Dave Newhouse from the Muffins is on it. Uh, Richard Wildman. Um, I've done uh, several albums with Carta Estra. You know Carta Estra? No. You need to look up Carta Estra. Look up uh, Strange Relations. It's a fantastic record. That was our first one together. And uh, we have one called Infernal Spheres. And we have one called Time and Stars. Uh, I played on David Allen's last album, on the David Allen Weird Quartet. That was going to be a Weird Biscuit Tea Time record. That was going to be the second Weird Biscuit Tea Time. And uh, the original drummer on that was Trey Sabatelli, who plays with the tubes. And uh, he was not available to, to reconstitute this project. And so Don asked me... Uh, if I wanted in on the thing. And I said, yeah. I said, if David's okay with it, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be on a Weird Biscuit Tea Time record with David Allen and you and Michael Clare and all those great players, sure. So 
So then we get the record done. David passes away. Oh. Uh, Cleopatra, the record label that ended up putting it out on vinyl and CD, um, they wanted David's name to be part of it, of the title. So it went from being Weird Biscuit Tea Time to David Allen Weird Quartet. And oh. it's a pretty cool record. It's, it's a pretty cool record. And when did that get released? Uh, just, oh, hell, I don't know. Within the last few years. Oh, okay. And then you have this Muffins box set coming up? Yes, that's, uh, we have, and we have, we have an enormous archive. We probably have 60 or 70 CDs worth of stuff we've recorded over the years, um, going back to the 70s. And we record rehearsals, we record jam sessions, we record concerts, gig, I mean, all this stuff. So we've, we've been sifting through all that stuff. And uh, I think we're, I think we're a little, I think we're over 10, 10 discs at the moment. Any idea and, of when that might be available? No, I'm not even going to speculate. Okay. Yeah, these archival projects can be massive. I'm, I'm <laughs> playing it safe because there's so much stuff. Yeah. But uh, we're leaving all the decisions to Steve. Okay. Good. Because, because we don't agree on everything. <laughs> which is, is, is to be expected, you know? Sure. So Steve did a great job with Open City. That was his baby. And this uh, box set is, uh, he's uh, been given the uh, authority to just make, make final say on everything. So, so right. there. So we have, we have Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul, thank you very much for spending some time with me here, reminiscing about uh, what really was, uh, I think, an amazing time for creative music. Um, and the, the explosion of activity that happened after the zoo festival uh, uh, is something that people really need to know about. And not, not everybody knows about uh, Giorgio Gomelski. You know, he's, uh, he kind of maintained uh, a fairly low profile. He never really promoted himself. And, yeah, he did. yeah, he did. He was, doing, uh, he was doing bar gigs in New York where he just sit on a People would pay him to sit on a bar stool and tell stories. Right. This was all part of the New York underground, though. He seemed to oh, maintain, yeah. uh, you know, he, he, he stayed in the New York underground for all those years. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of people yeah. like me on the West Coast didn't he had really a know the name. He had a, he had a whole, kind of, whole mess of stuff going on. You know, um, uh, you know who Basquiat is? Yeah. Basquiat lived in that house for a while. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that, uh, you never visited that place? No, no. Uh, I, I, I've been to New York many times, but uh, like I say, I didn't even know who Giorgio Gomelski was until a year after he died. Oh, I, I knew who he was the first time I bought a Yardbirds record. Yeah. The name well, just jumped out on me. I mean, it's like, you know, Jeff Beck, and then George Gomelski, and I'm going, huh? <laughs> right. Who did this person? Eat? And then, and then, um, his name kept popping up on all this music that I liked. Well, that's what I discovered so when I when I finally when I finally heard about who he was. I was reading I was reading a, a book about a prog band, and uh, it wasn't his name that came up. It was Eddie Offord's name the uh you know the engineer for yes and yeah, know, yeah. Palmer. and yeah. eddie eddie offered is quoted in this book uh talking about working on the first material recordings and i went what eddie offered worked with material and i started looking that up and of course it was Giorgio gomelski who got eddie offered and material together up in woodstock to record the first material stuff because right. Giorgio Gomelski had worked with Eddie Offord back in London in the 60s when Eddie Offord was a junior engineer at AdVision. Yeah, and, well, do you know, you know that uh, Whitney Houston's first recording was on a material record? Yeah, I, I've, I've seen that too. I, and I talked to, I talked to uh, you know, Don Davis, the sax player? 
Um, anyway, so I've talked to some of the people who, uh, uh, Martin BC was connected with Material intimately at that time. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Martin's, a, Martin's, a, Martin's, a, Martin's a great guy. Yeah, apparently Whitney's stuff was added in another studio uh, mm -hmm. separate from the Material uh, tracks. But yeah, so one of her first uh, releases was with Material and Nona Hendrix uh, sang with them too. And I think that was her first professional recording session. Right, yeah. And she's doing what? A Hugh Hopper tune of all things. <laughs> right yeah memories yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah well paul, I had the honor of meeting him once paul again i i can't thank you enough for uh sharing your time with us and uh telling us especially the uh, details about the zoo mana festival i mean uh amazing stories uh wonderful uh uh photos um thanks a lot paul no problem. Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for your your uh, your interest. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, guess what? Giorgio, who is a very kind soul, just looked at Paul and said, "Play more." So we'll play for you what we would expect to start. So we're going to do a, what we worked out, there's some music, musicians that are going to come on now and join us from a French band called Nefish Music. They've come all the way from France, and what we're going to be doing is a group composition that we all worked on <clears throat> about three or four days ago and uh, rehearsed for about four or five hours <laughs> whenever we get into time. What we have is the Muffins playing with Michael Raduli on saxophone, Dave Kastler on secondary bass, Francois Lazo on percussion, and Yoshko Sefer on soprano saxophone. And as a brief note, Yoshko Sefer was in Magma. <laughs> and was also a member and started the now legendary group Zao. 